Hello, and welcome to Orwellian, the podcast dedicated to the essays of George Orwell. When you hear the word Orwellian, what do you think of? Terrifying dystopias? State surveillance? The loss of personal freedom? Well, we think of tea, pubs, and the common toad. Join us, and we'll tell you why. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Lewis, and I'm here with my co-host, Simon. And today we are going to talk about Orwell's essay, Some Thoughts on the Common Toad. But before we start, Simon, it's spring. How are you at this fruitful, fecund time of the year? Yeah, not too good. I had problems with my car today. It got towed. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. We haven't mentioned the pun jar in a while. I think we've got to bring that back. 100 yen in the punja. We're in spring. Uh, we're recording this uh, in March, and it'll probably go out around about the end of March, beginning of April. Does the change in the seasons make a difference to you, Simon? It does. I, I love seasons. I love the, the changes in seasons. And I've spent some time living in tropical countries on the equator line, where there isn't really much seasonal variation. And I, I found it quite depressing and I really enjoy the different variations and especially where we are here where spring is so celebrated like that sense of renewal and... yes those listeners who are not regular should eat some prunes no those listeners who are not regular need to be told that Simon and I live in Japan and Japan uh, very famously boasts of its four separate seasons of course that's Uh, A bit debatable. Uh, The weather isn't always perfect, but it is a lot more reliable than it is in Scotland, where I'm from. And it's called Hanami, where the the cherry blossom... Cherry blossom viewing. And uh, the reason it's so famous in Japan is because it it, it mirrored the temporal nature of life, and and it also gives you a sense of renewal and hope. And without meaning to get too deep, in, in these times of coronavirus and pandemic, it does give you a sense of hope and that hopefully the rest of this year, as the good weather comes and the, the flowers blossom, can be a lot better than it has been for the last year. Yes, and we'll come back to that in Orwell's essay because there was a parallel um, in the times he was writing. And following on from what you just said there, Simon, do you remember last year when uh, the coronavirus was really people were really starting to recognise how big a problem it was. Do do you remember what the governor of Tokyo said about the effect that the coronavirus would have on the Hanami season? He just towed the line, didn't he? You're going (laughs) to... Followed the party line. (laughs) So, um, Yuriko Koike, the governor of Tokyo last year, discouraged people from having cherry blossom viewing parties. Uh, that's something people do in Japan at this time of year. They sit beneath a cherry tree and they get royally drunk and eat nice Japanese food. Um, but she said that taking away the pleasures of cherry blossom viewing from the Japanese was like taking away hugs from Italian people. Um, And I think that gives you some idea of how important the coming of spring is here in Japan. But of course, we're not talking about Japan specifically today. We're talking about Orwell, who was writing in England at the end of the Second World War. So let's get into it now. We're talking about anywhere to anyone who's listening that celebrates nature. Yes. That looks out their window and appreciates the planet how it is looks out of their window or indeed up from their phone. Um, (laughs) I think I just sounded about 100 years old then, didn't (laughs) I? Um, But I am in spirit, I think about 129. But today we are discussing George Orwell's essay, Some Thoughts on the Common Toad, which was published in the Tribune on the 12th of April in spring 1946. Before we start, Simon, what was your reaction to this quite short essay? I love this essay. This is this is one of the Orwell essays I was aware of, and it impacts upon me greatly because I love nature. 
I mean, we've both been hiking together many times and you know that, well, from my personal history, how much time I've spent in nature and how much I appreciate it. And you also know how anti-commodification of society I am. So those two things combined, which we'll discuss in this essay, has a big impact on, upon me every time I read it. And we'll probably talk today a lot about the themes in this essay, but do you know what stuck out to me as I read it again? How beautifully written it is. Yes, the difference between the lightness of Orwell's touch and the heaviness of his sentiments, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, he really yeah, was a, a very, very talented writer, and we'll see that as we go on. When re reading this, I thought he could be working for BBC's Planet Earth in describing nature, and describing a very nondescript component of nature in many people's eyes, but not in Orwell's. Yeah, it's such a beautifully written essay. And it is short, how you mentioned, but it just goes to show to all the school teachers and academics out there, something doesn't have to be long-winded to, to make a point. Yes, and it doesn't have to be prescriptive either. I think later on we'll get into how mm. Orwell, even though he is very much being ideological, he, he's not being prescriptive in this essay. And I think it's really an essay that invites all comers to learn about and to appreciate the, the joys of the natural world. And as Orwell puts it, a phrase I really like, the process of living. Yeah. Let's begin then, shall we? Let's jump in. So Orwell starts by describing the life cycle of the common toad. This is one of the first creatures in England, where Orwell was living, to emerge from wintering when the spring comes. Now, Simon, why do you think Orwell chose this creature, the common toad, in his essay about spring and the importance of the natural world? What, what's your first thought when you think of a toad? Witches, I suppose. Dog ugly. Mm. It, I, it, it, I, it's it's the black sheep of the natural world. It's, it's, surely, bond, it's surely, bond life. Surely black sheep are the black sheep of the natural world. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> it's the black sheep of the pond. He's specifically chosen the toad because it goes against most notions of nature and what is represented in poetry and prose over the years and what people imagine to be the beauty of nature. And it's very clever the way he's done so. He's, I mean, he says himself, like, mention the spawning of the toads because it's one of the phenomena of spring which most deeply appealed to me. And because the toad, unlike the skylark and the primrose, has never had much of a boost from poets. So even f when observing a pond, he is vocalising the, the, the periphery, the left out, the underclass. Yes. Those traditionally looked upon as not on an equal pegging in society. Yes, and later on he goes on to mention how the toad, if you really stop and look at it, has the most beautiful eye yeah. of any creature. So again, I, I really like how you brought in the idea of celebrating the unsung, the periphery, yeah. and that really relates to Orwell's political position, doesn't it? And compared to a lot of his essays, when describing the toad, you can really see here he's mustering his creative abilities to to really do justice to the beauty of the toad and his beautiful prose and it's no coincidence that he's mentioning how skylarks and primroses are prevalent in poetry because he's writing poetically himself about the toad yes and did you think we're, we're going to get on i'm sure to the idea of commercialism and yeah. capitalism later but did you also think that Perhaps one of the reasons that the poets don't write about toads is that toads aren't commercial. No one wants to buy a book of poems about amphibians, or it's certainly not going to make you a lot of money. Absolutely. When you're flicking through your book of 19th or 20th century poetry and you see the toad, <laughs> you, don't, you don't put your finger on the page, do you? You wait for the, the nubious cloud or the, or yeah, the skylark or the primrose. Another thing, I think we're going to get into the, um, the temporal 
nature of, of this essay later. But just to start off with, did you see any parallels between the emergence of the toad from the ground and other things that were going on in the world at the time? Do you know what, Lewis? I didn't see it, but now you're, now you're saying it. It's a very good observation because it's 1946. We've just, the World War II has just ended. And we're all emerging from the horror of war and embarking upon this new phase of human civilization. Yes, if I can quote Orwell here, this is the very beginning of the essay. Before the swallow, before the daffodil, and not much later than the snowdrop, the common toad salutes the coming of spring after his own fashion. That's very Orwellian. <laughs> after his own fashion, in his own time, which is to emerge from a hole in the ground where he has lain buried, my emphasis, since the previous autumn, and crawl, crawl as rapidly as possible towards the nearest suitable patch of water. It just really made me think of people in the rubble of the Blitz, or Very in, good point, in yeah. the foxholes of the battlefields yeah. of the war, crawling out of their holes, getting progressing with life, getting away from danger. Very good point. He's been he spent the war years in London where every, most evenings they would go subterranean to, to get away from the bombing and then each morning crawl out again to embrace life. Yes, and his flat was actually blitzed at one point. So Where was he living in London? Was it I just remember he lived in a couple of different places in London, but I think the flat he had that was blitzed was in Maida Vale near Paddington. Mm, interesting. But it just really put me in mind of that time and, and the parallels between the human and animal world. Yeah, I mean, there's so many metaphors we could draw from this, isn't there? It's not like the swallow coming out at spring. He's specifically chosen the toad because society at this stage coming out of World War II, it's not a beautiful creature. It's a, it's pond life. It's, it's and not an intentional pun, but it, it's an ugly representation of civilization that we now have to embrace for what it, for what it's worth. The toad is the pro, perhaps, of yeah. the natural world. And as we all know, hope lies within the pros, yeah. to quote 1984. So after describing the life cycle of the toad, don't worry if you don't like toads, because Orwell <laughs> says, he points out, that you do not need to be interested in toads to enjoy the coming of spring. Neither do you need to be interested in creatures or plants at all. You can simply enjoy the warmth. You can simply enjoy the sky. Uh, we have here, to quote Orwell again, even in the most sordid street, the coming of spring will register itself by some sign or other, if it is only a brighter blue between the chimney pots or the vivid green of an elder sprouting on a blitzed site. So you don't even have to be particularly into animals to enjoy the coming of spring. It's a yeah. pleasure that we can enjoy no matter who we are, isn't it, Simon? Yeah, but wh why does he feel nature's a threat? Why is he preaching to us in this essay that we have to appreciate na nature? I think it's because, and please tell me your opinion, sure, sure. Um, I think it's because of commercialization. The war is yeah. over, but we are now getting back to business, literally. Capitalism is going to take hold of society once more. But Orwell thinks that an enjoyment of nature is a kind of act of resistance yeah. to monetarization, to capitalization. Right here, the point is that the pleasures of spring are available to everybody and cost nothing. What, what did you think of that? I think you've done really well to pick up that quote. I, that was my favorite quote of the entire essay. I'm, so Orwell is celebrating an uncommodified environment explicitly because it doesn't obey the rules of the market which he can see lowering its hand upon all of us post-world war ii he's exulting at the thought of birds in the midst of bourgeois britain flagrantly avoiding rent <laughs> yes 
brilliant quote here. There must be some hundreds of thousands, if not millions of birds, living inside the four mile radius, that's the city of London. Yeah. And it is rather a pleasing thought that none of them pays a halfpenny of rent. Yeah, I love that. That, that's a clear dig at the way society is going and that the commodification of absolutely everything in London and the, as soon as the war's over, rent prices are going up and, and he, he's rebelling against it and saying, well, look at these birds. They, they, they've got it right. So um, Orwell is concerned with feelings in some groups that there is something reprehensible in enjoying nature, right? Yes. Orwell notes that those on the contemporary left often argue that a love of nature is politically wrong. Yeah. Um, the reasons for this are that, as far as they're concerned, at best it's overly nostalgic, and at worst it's impractical, and it takes our minds off the injustices of the capitalist mm. system. What, what did you make of this? Yeah, you're right. For the, for the political discontent groaning under the capitalist system the love of nature seems sentimental and others seem to see the appreciation of nature as reactionary in this machine age in which the concept of machinery and technology has boomed through the roof over the last six years of war but um Orwell a lifelong socialist defends an appreciation of nature as something that made a peaceful and decent future a little more probable. Yes, he argues against this because according to Orwell, should humankind ever solve its social and political problems and create a kind of utopia, then he thinks our mental life would be left impoverished yeah, if point. our free time was taken up solely by artificial pleasures. He, yeah. he makes this rather funny comment about um, the sort of pleasure one gets from finding the first primrose will, in a labour-saving utopia, loom larger than the sort <laughs> of pleasure one gets from eating an ice to the tune of a Wurlitzer. Which, for today, read Big Mac. <laughs> Big whilst, Mac and Netflix. Whilst, whilst looking at Instagram, yeah. Um, that really, I think we'll maybe talk about that more later, yeah. Simon, but that really struck me because it made me think very much of the position many of us have found ourselves in during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Shut indoors with, with, if we're lucky enough to be able to afford it, decent food and Netflix, yeah. but still feeling a kind of emptiness. Yeah, this is getting me through now, but this is very short and... I love the way, the, the joy that Orwell took in toads <laughs> and other creatures that evade the market's invisible hand hints at an older kind of society, doesn't it? it Again, does. we mention it in every podcast, Orwell's nostalgia. So Lewis, like when you think back on societies gone by, in which one and at which time would you have liked to have lived? That's a good question. I often think that like Orwell, Orwell often said that he would have probably made a good vicar, that he would have liked to be a country vicar sometime between about 1750 and 1830. And I often feel the same thing about myself. I think I'd like to live in a rural parish and spend a couple of days a week writing my sermon and then the rest of the time chasing butterflies for my collection. Umpiring the village cricket. Yes, yes, something like that. Or indeed living in, you know, I, I live in 21st century Japan, but I often think living in the Edo period and enjoying the, the pleasures of the seasons in the Edo period, the cherry blossom, the irises in the summer, uh, the snow in the winter. God, I, I really do yearn for a simpler life. How about you, Simon? I would like to have been Caligula's party planner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd get tired after a while. Yeah, so, um, no, I, I agree with you. I, in, in these times of pandemic and whenever I'm busy or feeling stressed, I often find myself um, fantasising about nature. 
about opportunities to escape to nature. Last summer, uh, as you know, I, I escaped down to Wakayama Prefecture and I walked the Kamano Kodo, which is famous as Japan's most spiritual long distance hike. And just one week of hiking along there gave me so much motivation to, to go on. And, and then I came back to Tokyo, which is the, probably the most urban environment known to mankind. But. but you know, Simon, I have lived in Tokyo for five, six years now. I'm a cunt, well. You are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, but you don't have to say it. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was about to say I'm a country boy. That's not right. I'm a suburbanite, <laughs> but I grew up very close to the country. I think we need to keep this in. Uh, um, I grew up very close to the countryside. And when I first came to Tokyo, I thought I was going to live in a concrete jungle and there wasn't yeah. going to be any nature anywhere. But one of the things that has really reconciled me to living in Tokyo is the amount of nature in Tokyo. Um, yeah. It's the, the trees, the flowers. I live in the east part of Tokyo, near a river and near Tokyo Bay. And there's a massive amount of bird life, seabirds, river birds. And I've learned their names. I've learned their names in Japanese. I know when they're going to be away because it's the winter and they're eating uh, in the, 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 they're hunting in the sea and then they come What's back. What's the animal I told you I saw when I went on an evening walk once? The tanuki. Yeah, which is quite unique mm. to Tokyo, isn't it? The, the raccoon dog. Yeah, it's amazing. I couldn't believe I saw that. But living in London previously, I would always bump into foxes whilst out and about walking. London's a very rural city and Orwell mentions it here, doesn't he? Even in the most bleak of streets in London when spring arrives you can see greenery popping up where you least expect it to. And the quote I really like about how he's seen a kestrel hovering over the Deptford gas works mm. which is something that's happened to me too I've seen a kestrel hovering in central Tokyo. The political point Orwell's trying to make though he says that we can have our pleasures in a labour-saving utopia but he thinks that if our free time was taken up solely by artificial pleasures, eating an ice to the tune of a Wurlitzer, this would leave humanity vulnerable. We'd have this excess energy, this excess yearning, and it would leave us vulnerable to the kind of political movements and emotions which may destroy us in the end. Here's his quote here. If we live, I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing here. Orwell thinks if we live in a labour-saving utopia, human beings will have no outlet for their surplus energy except in hatred and yeah. leader worship. Now, Simon, we, compared to 1946, we kind of live in that labour-saving utopia. Yeah. Hatred and leader worship, does it sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, the dictators and bureaucrats of the world, metaphorically, are trying to ruin spring as they force every living organism among us to bear the consequences for their profits. Climate change. Climate change. Cultural populism. And so on. So yeah, it's... it's if Orwell had lived to see what happened... So he died in 1950. And the 1950s saw this advent of mass consumerism where every household had to have a fridge and a TV. He'd have been horrified because he was warning of us about this in, in the essay, saying that this advent of the commodification of culture, of society, this becoming of mass consumerism will detach us from our bond with nature. And that bond with nature is what grounds us as organisms on temporarily on this planet and when we lose that attachment to our bond with nature we are susceptible to the propaganda of people who would like us to continue buying products which are forced upon us and it's because when we lose the ability to have to take pleasure in what orwell calls the process of life there's a kind of, it leaves a void, doesn't it? 
Mm. And the void needs to be filled by something. And that's when the politicians, the demagogues, take their opportunity to fill our ears with poison and to use us to fulfil, well, to glorify themselves yeah. and their ideologies. He says that people, so the thought runs, ought to be discontented. And it's our job to multiply our wants and not simply to increase our enjoyment of the things we have already. There you go. Orwell's quote in Consumerism. Hmm. But are you guilty of it, Lewis? I am. We're all guilty of it, and that's the problem. This is going to be one of the most difficult things we have to deal with in this century. How do we mediate between living a free life and achieving the things we want to achieve and also not destroying the planet we live on? I wish I had the answers. If I did, I would be another Greta Thunberg. Well, um, the answer is quite simply embracing simplicity. Yeah. Embracing nature. And just people were very happy before Instagram. We were doing just fine before Amazon, where we, a click delivers everything to our house. Before the internet. Before teletext. Before the tech. We were doing just fine in our, in, in our position in the world. But does that mean we have to go backwards? Well, once you, once you have something, it's difficult to go backwards. Because now we do know the experience of the internet and instant gratification. It will be exceedingly difficult to persuade society now to take a step, I say in inverted commas, backwards. Which is the only way we're going to be able to save ourselves from this destruction we're imposing upon our planet. But I don't think it's necessarily about moving backwards or forwards. First of all, if we go back to the essay, Orwell is saying you should take pleasure in nature, you should take pleasure in the process of life, you should take pleasure in the change of the seasons. If you take pleasure in these things, then you will be less susceptible to ideology. You will be less susceptible to just accepting what your great leaders tell you. I think that if you take an interest in the natural world, you are less likely to be a narcissist. Yeah. Because I think if you are aware that there are other creatures in this world, I eat meat, I have gone fishing. You I fart like a trooper. <laughs> I think that's by the by. Um, oh no, I see what you mean, methane. Exactly. I do these things, and yet I believe that my interest in the natural world helps me to remain grounded and helps me to remember that, first of all, human beings are animals. And because we are animals, we need an environment too. Yeah. The... I think one of the biggest threats to our to nature today, along with capitalism, is the techie types who want to take away our humanity and bring about the singularity and make us live forever, which I think is it's a it's an ideology which will eventually lead to destruction. But this this is my problem. So let me give you an example. I imagine you, like me, often fantasise of trips to the countryside. But when you're in the countryside, how long is it before you're yearning to come back to the city and all it beholds? I mean, Simon, I could live in the countryside very happily, but I don't because our capitalist system doesn't allow me <laughs> to find a job. There. But I think if you did actually take the plunge and move to the country, in a month you would be yearning for what? the city can offer you. Well, I've never had the chance to, to try. But I think we're getting... Uh, so, sorry to interrupt, but I find that like what we romantically cherish is actually often very utilitarian. So we look at these people living in the countryside and think, what an idyllic life they have. But for them, it's a util utilitarian existence. And they're looking at us and thinking, God, how easy you have it there in the city. How wonderful that must be. And then... 
what we don't know is we, we're just in a rat race running around in circles the whole time. See, Simon, I don't think this essay is about living simply or, or, or Orwell promoting the simple life. I think this essay is basically saying that if you take an interest in nature, you will be less prey to the kind of ideologies, the totalitarian ideologies that Orwell was concerned with at the time. What do you think about environmentalism? Would you say that plays a bigger role in this essay as that of commodification and consumerism? Well, I do know that some modern commentators who write about this essay do describe Orwell as a proto-environmentalist. And if he had lived beyond 1950, I would have been very interested to see where he would have gone with his ideas about the environment. Certainly, I think this essay is pretty seminal in what it says about environmentalism being divorced from the desire for profit. Yeah. So this was published in 1946, this essay. And 1946 is just when we started to enter what's now known as the Great Acceleration, which is the period in which the human boot weighs heavily since the Industrial Revolution and the advent of machinery. And this boot begins to stamp on the face of nature. So throughout the post-war boom, and by that, I mean predominantly the 50s, late 40s, 50s, so all I would have missed most of it, um, the tremendous expansion of the global e economy draws more and more of the world into this circuit of capital, which has no regard for the environment. Yes, and I think we can see that in the way the left has changed its position on nature since that time. Because as we already mentioned, Orwell says, or Orwell writes, that at that time, a lot of left-wing people saw a love of nature as being sentimental and retrograde. But I think these days, environmentalism is very, seen as, is, is very much seen as a left-wing concern, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's because right-wing politics has less to do these days with traditionalism or uh, keeping things as they are and more to do with making money. So conservatism has tied its colours to the mast of the open market, the free market, and therefore oil and other commodities such as that which can be mined are entirely based upon the free market being successful and therefore people on the right are very sceptical of environmentalism and its message. And even those that are aware of the science seem to play down the necessity to act now. We all drive cars, use hair dryer, or you use a hair dryer in the morning. We... It, it takes a lot to make it look this good. <laughs> We turn on our TVs, our computers, our air purifiers, our lamps, our phone chargers all the time. And we all boast about our various travels with Vietnam without looking into the fact that we had to travel by aeroplane and all that jet fuel that destroyed the environment and the hostel we stayed in next to the beach that rele releases its sewage into the ocean, etc., etc. We're all responsible. But this consumerism is driven by big business, which is marching blindly into a catastrophe. Have you seen the, and I forget the name, it's a Danny Boyle film, science fiction film, Sunshine, I think it's called. No, I've not seen it. Where they, they go on a space mission to set up a nuclear weapon inside the sun to spark it into life so planet Earth can survive. But on this space mission which takes them decades you know the nature of the distance to the sun they take it in turns to sit in this room where they're immersed into a virtual reality world of nature and they can choose rainforest mountain pasture running stream so in there where they have no access to nature their ideal of escapism and happiness 
is using technology to be in nature. And that kind of thing has always disturbed me a bit because it's made me think of a future where nature doesn't exist apart from humans. But on the other hand, in a way, we're already there and we've been there for a couple of hundred years because what is a park but a man-made or rather human-made space which approximates nature but is artificial. And I would argue that a park is just as valid a place to enjoy the natural world, the process of life, as some untouched corner of the Amazon. But I'm, I don't like how humans try to determine nature. You've not been to China, have you? But no. If you've been to China within the last 20 years, what's happening there is they feel that they are the masters of nature. And it's wrong. And they are so wrong with how they are shifting the earth within that country and this great boom of urbanization. And it made me feel very uncomfortable when I was there. And I like to, I think here in Japan, despite the urban fantasization people have of Japan and Tokyo, there is a harmony with nature in this society. Well, and most, most construction is done with that in mind. Well, if you think about it, China is where Japan was 30, 40 years ago. Japan went through its big boom uh, from the 50s to the 80s, where they were diverting rivers and digging away the sides of mountains. And then, and, and water quality, I sometimes get very nostalgic and wish I could experience Japan in the post-war period, but then I remember that water quality, air quality, was terrible at that time. And these days in Tokyo, air quality is very good, water quality is very good. As I mentioned, I, I live in a part of Tokyo where you can see so much nature, even though it's very, very urban. So maybe eventually China will come to that state of harmony through a change in policy. We can, we can only hope, at least. Yeah. And also, of course, what is China's biggest soft power tool these days? It's the panda. And it's the, the millions and millions of dollars they've poured into saving the panda. And, the and what better habitat. symbol of human encroachment onto, into nature than the, that of the panda, the endangered panda, which is a real big contradiction, if you ask me, in China. And I love animals, but the panda, and, and please don't get angry, but the panda, arguably an animal that's too stupid and lazy to survive. Bloody useless. <laughs> so Simon, going back to the idea of enjoying nature, I would call myself an observer of nature. When I travel to a new place, I always like to identify the birds, the plants, to learn their names, to know what I'm actually looking at. You're a nature lover, but you're a different kind of nature lover from me aren't you yeah i mean you describe yourself very well as an observer of nature i i guess i would say i'm a participant of nature so when you and i go hiking together i'm, I'm enjoying feeling the fresh air being outside getting a sweat on pounding up the mountain whereas you'll often be stopping me and pointing out a heron or a buzzard or a buzzard or a kestrel or something so yeah, we, we differ in our appreciation of nature. Or I'll be telling you about the time that I came across a snake and I was the only one who wasn't too scared to... Yeah, and to... then making me paranoid for the rest, <laughs> of the, the rest of the hike. But I think this is the point really in the essay. Um, Orwell is not prescriptive. You do not have to be a lover of the common toad. You do not have to be an observer of nature like me to appreciate nature and to feel the benefit of nature in your life. You could be more of a, a casual participant in nature, like Simon is. A anything, as long as it's riveting. I, I, told, I told you that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, so to, to kind of bring this... To... By the way, why is toad in the hole called toad in the hole? It's a good point. I don't know. Is it because when you put it in... Have you ever cooked it? 
Mm. So when you put the sausages in the mix, they're hidden underneath. Right? Yes, yes, like a toad in the egg. Uh, and then as it cooks, the sausages pop out of the top. That's a good point. I think that's exactly why it's called that, which tells you a lot about how much our ancestors observe nature. There you go, yeah. Um, yes, this is the point in Orwell's essay. I love toad in the hole. Yes. Is, yeah. there, any, is there an essay on toad in the hole? There's an essay on British cooking that we'll get to. Oh, I do look forward to that one. Um, but of course, that doesn't involve toads. We'll get one of our non-British friends as a guest on the podcast when we do the British food one. Yes, that'd be good fun. Yeah, get a, a, a neutral viewpoint. Then we'll censor everything they say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I had a pound for every time a student said to me, I hear British food is not delicious. <laughs> um, if I had a pound for every time, I could, uh, I could buy some nice toad in the hole. So... Let's bring this to a close. Um, Simon, do you think it's right that a love of nature can be good for you, can keep you sane, can keep you immune from damaging ideologies? I believe so. And by ignoring the influence of nature upon us, you're ignoring the very essence of what and where we come from. So that said, you don't have to love nature. You don't have to spend your weekends getting out there, skipping around a meadow. You just have to respect it and appreciate its existence. And notice it now and, and then. And notice it. And realise that we are guests within its realm. We've been talking a lot about nature with a capital N, but I think what really Orwell is getting at in this essay is the idea of what he calls the process of life. Remember, for all the talk about humans being able to live forever by the end of the century, remember that you are alive, you are part of nature, and when you go outside, all of that stuff, the bird song, the warm weather, the cold weather, the fresh air, it's all for free. You don't have to pay any money for it. That is outside of the capitalist system. So well, you have to pay to get into Tokyo's biggest park. But not all of the parks. <laughs> so appreciate it. We haven't really talked much about the COVID-19 pandemic, but speaking personally here, this essay is very important for me because Orwell wrote this at a time when Europe was in ruins. Much of the world was in ruins. And it must have been quite hard to see how... Things could have gone on. But despite that, things did go on. Spring came again and life continued. You've been listening to Orwellian with me, Lewis. And myself, Simon. We are on... We should do the, the two Ronnies next time. That's, and that's mm. it from him and that's it from... Um, do you think? You've been listening to Orwellian with me, Lewis. And myself, Simon. And we are on Apple Pods, Google Pods, Amazon Music, Spotify. We're also on Instagram. And we have a an email address, orwellpod at gmail.com. Please write what to us. What were you saying about the tech giants? Anyway, <laughs> we're on all those things. Find us there. Although if you're listening to this, you've already found us. Yes, and I'm sure you're regretting it. <laughs> right, that's it, everyone. Next week, we're going to be talking about the essay Common Lodging Houses, which is Simon's choice, but don't worry, it'll be all right. All right, everyone, or well this as well. Oh. Oh.